All right, so I'm Sam Crow. Like like uh, Greg said, I work for Stealth Energy Group in Williston, and I don't know if you can hear Harold or me I'm without Harold. Yeah, without the microphone. This might be kind of awkward, but we're going to talk to you today about slope reclamation, steep slopes, and risk management with that. All right. So first off, what is the importance of slope, steep slope reclamation? So we have here we have two different examples, and this would be both from Energy Transfer, um, a company that does uh, moves transports gas and crude oil and produce water. So this is in Pennsylvania, and on the left we have one scenario, and on the right is a different picture for a different scenario, and this is really just like a worst case like a catastrophic example, but this is what can happen if we don't take into consideration our steep slopes. So you can see this is just what a slip is, a slip or a slide, like a landslide is what we're gonna be talking about today. You can see where the soil has sloughed off and it actually exposed the pipe in one of these situations and then it lit on fire and caused a huge forest fire. So literally everything you could think of went wrong. Um, so in this situation, the Revolution and the other one was the Rover. They had two different scenarios by the same company within the same year. Um, they were fined up to $30 million in their fines, and then the reclamation and reinstallation of the construction was upwards of that as well. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, this doesn't happen often in North Dakota, but you know, little mini accidents of this can can happen and could be catastrophic to everybody. Yeah, in this instance here, you can see the right of way uh, that comes down, makes a 98, goes down. That's energy transfer slide. Uh, the, the participation that we had uh, was the yellow line marker that you can see right here, and then the group of yellow vests and the white hard hats. That happened to be the client I was working for at that time, their line. So, uh, in many of these instances, there are multiple operators that are running through the same right away. So as the lines are installed over uh, extended time periods, the potential risk to uh, several operators is significant. Once again, uh, I'll go first since I've got the microphone. I'm Harold Rhodes. I worked in civil construction. Uh, for several years, worked in the woods, worked in the steep slopes, uh, and most recently focused on, on reclamation and communication related activities. And I'm Sam, and I've been working with Harold on a lot of these projects. Um, a lot of the examples we're going to talk about today actually take place in Ohio and West Virginia, um, but we'll kind of walk you through how we can make these connections back to North Dakota and how they're applicable here. So mass wasting is kind of our first term that we're going to throw out there today. And it's really kind of just what it sounds like and the main explanation of a slip. So you have a large mass of soil that is like wasting down the hill. So it's just sliding down the hill. And you can see at the bottom of this photo up here that there's like a big pile of sludge at the bottom. Um, so it's just soil moving downward of a slope by gravity. Um, it can happen in slumps, slips, debris flows down this hill. It's often lubricated by rainfall. It can happen from seismic activity. Um, we can have springs that are underground naturally occurring that could be feeding it and causing it to slough off. Um, intense rainfall is another one that we saw out in Ohio and West Virginia. Um, they get very violent rains and very often, and especially on a fresh wider way, this could happen. Yeah, so when we look at this, once again, this is one of our client right of ways. Uh, to the right, is that going to be right? Yeah. To the right, that's our dirt side of the trench for those of you that are familiar with kind of a uh, pipeline terminology. Uh, on the left here, that was the actual trench line. What we found that, what we found was that, that uh, a vast majority of our slips were directly related to the, um, the hydraulic conductivity related to the disturbance of the installation of the pipeline. Uh, specifically, what we found was the location of those trench breakers and ensuring that we had adequate drainage 
uh, at or adjacent to those trench pressures. Uh, so as we come down the hill here, uh, each one of these slips where we started seeing uh, water actually coming out of the ground was directly adjacent to those trench pressures. So how do we describe slopes and what is slope? So slope is just rise over run. That's how I think of it. That's how we were taught from it. So if we can see we have the run over the rise or under the rise. So a lot of the slopes that we're dealing with in these scenarios are probably very steep to extreme. So greater than 35% slopes. And just for a reference to the construction world, we have a, a two to one slope would be 50 and then like a three to one and a four to one are like less steep. So we're dealing with like the three to two to one slopes in these situations. One of those things too that, that commonly occur as far as what we're looking at that potentially could be a, a risk or something that we want to be aware of from an environmental standpoint is this right here. In almost every instance at the bottom of these swales, dips, valleys, draws, whatever you call them, is that, and that is surface water. That surface water is a uh, almost universal trigger for various reporting obligations, if it were in fact. This one's you. <laughs> yep, yeah, this is me. Okay, so some people, when we look at that from a, from a operator or producer perspective, one of the things we're looking at that potentially can risk is risks to uh, system integrity. So this right here is the riser that comes up over our main line, uh, that the slope started to fail, just upgrade putting that valve set here, and then a valve set that's sloping here, back in this location, also under tension to where it was actually pulling around. Same thing with this one here. This was adjacent to uh, well pad, and that the drainage uh, was pooling right here along the fence line and actually saturating those soils right above that wetland that cuts that to fail and, and enter that way. And then once again, water is an automatic trigger. So it's from a reporting action standpoint. So when we think about the risks of slope stabilization, the EPA actually has a list of environmental risks that they put together. And the main ones that come to mind um, are most of the ones from the EPA, but risk to public safety, risk to the environment, and risk to system integrity. So we also look at the cultural risk. So is there, this kind of goes with the public safety, cultural, social. So if we go back to the most extreme case that we looked at, if we have a slip that's causing a fire and taking out people's livelihoods that are loggers and they live in the woods, so that's a very large risk to them. If we talk about economic risk, is it going to cost us a lot of money? Yes, it's going to cost a lot of money to fix. It's going to cost those landowners and homeowners a lot of money to relocate. Um, and then for a legal risk as well that the EPA poses, is this going to get us into a legal battle? As the operator, likely yes. It's going to be a long road ahead of you. And like Harold said, water is going to be a trigger to report this. So immediately then you're into the legal battle. So application here in North Dakota, we kind of mentioned already, um, and a lot of your minds probably went to the badland setting, um, anything in the park, on the forest service land. Um, those are the types of landscapes that we're gonna find this most often. There are paths that aren't in the badland setting that are just up on hill slopes that are gonna have very steep slopes. I know there's some compressor stations and power stations that sit up on a hill and their slopes are really hard to stabilize. So. New construction, so pads and pipelines that run across um, hilly landscapes, creeks and stream crossings, like Harold was saying, the water at the bottom of that slope, um, there's going to be impacts to that too. Like if you have to cross the stream during pipeline construction, um, reclamation, of course, and remediation and response, I think is important too, a spill response, if it's a spill to water or if it's close to water. Um, some digging halls that we do, there's going to be a lot of reconstruction that goes into that. 
Another thing that I think is really interesting in, in this specific photograph, which obviously this is North Dakota, is some of the, the variation in the actual plant communities in the soils. So that's kind of a critical kind of first indication of potentially what could be a, a suitable or ideal uh, plant community for a, a future reclamation or ultimately restoration of kidneys. All right, so how do we characterize triggers or how do we find out if this slip or how this slip happened or the triggers that made it happen? So steep slopes is the first one. I mean, let's not overlook the obvious. I mean, last night we talked about simple over fancy and not overthinking it. Like, are you going to have a difficult time walking up this slope like without assistance? Or are you going to tumble all the way down if you try to attempt? Yeah. We've both done that a lot. <laughs> um, here, especially in the Badlands setting, like a coal seam outcrop, you see the coal seams running by. So if you try to pile a whole soil profile on top of a very weak coal seam, I mean, just think about what you what happened in your head. It's going to slough off. Colluvial soils, I mean, the slips are exactly what that says. It's just caused by gravity. If you see rock outcrop on the bottom, and maybe it revenged itself and you haven't inspected it in a while, you could make the assumption that this has fallen down in the past. Seeps and natural drainage kind of goes together. A lot of what we experienced out east was natural drainage channels. There's springs in North Dakota everywhere. They come out of nowhere and it just, you know, it makes a weak for foundation for these soils. Yeah, and just going back to that, what, what we really found interesting after, you know, looking at some of these issues in North Dakota or uh, out west and West Virginia, Pennsylvania and Ohio, is that a lot of these potential risks or triggers uh, would have been evident during that initial survey and, and stormwater uh, planning and inspection. That's, that was one of our other, you know, big takeaways is that uh, we did identify this initially. So uh, as far as the potential risk considerations, as Sam said earlier, what we're looking at is our landowners. Our landowners are, are one of the primary or initial stakeholders that we engage when we start looking at uh, what is the initial or interim reclamation going to look like. And that goes as far as uh, the various plant species that they would like to see. Oftentimes, if it's in an area that they could pay or farm or want to maintain, that'll dictate a specific grass or plant community. But when we get in some of these areas to where there's physically not going to be any access, uh, the industry almost always uh, uses that same species down those steep slopes. And that's, that's, I think that's one of the, the primary issues from the industry perspective to where there needs to be kind of a change that, that plant species groups need to be. Uh, sites but specific. Same thing with uh, environmental, when we look at that, all of those potential risks are, are typically captured within that initial desktop survey uh, from erosion potentials to surface water uh, receptors. And then also we're looking at system integrity. How do we maintain it where some of the uh, corrosion control or, or CP stations and stuff like that, ensuring that those Critical infrastructure management pieces are located in areas that we can reach and access is absolutely critical. Uh, and then that goes into the system operation of maintenance. They're expecting, or we assume that that asset is gonna be in operation for years, for decades. So ensuring that, that all of these critical access points are in fact accessible is, is really key. All right, so precipitation, it's our best friend, right? And worst enemy. So the maps on the, the left side there um, aren't really anything that you wouldn't expect to see. They're just showing the 30 year average rainfall on the top is June and on the bottom is September. So like we would expect, there's gonna be more rainfall in North Dakota in June and less in September. And you can see it's not uniform across the state. So Fargo is a lot different than Williston. Um, so you just need to take these 
into consideration when you're making your remediation plans, but reclamation, excuse me. Um, but when we think about slips, 70% of our slips happen when the soil is completely saturated. So when it's in a saturated high precipitation, those heavy violent rainfalls, that's when most of them happen. Um, with that, if you're looking to reclaim a stream crossing or you have a steep slope that you need to do some construction first and then do some biological after, you need to plan around the rain events. So planting the sh like some shrubs or some doing some brush bundles that, you know, it might not work best when you're expecting a rain right away, but sometimes it will if you need to establish vegetation. So incorporating best practices in site-specific scenarios. So I think it's very important to look at the excavator in the bottom corner. It's cute. Um, <laughs> it's like, where's Wallow? That's actually the door prize right there. You know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so no, I think it's important to think about all the things that we're going to walk you through for the remainder of the presentation before you even start. So the reclamation starts before you start work. So like Harold mentioned in the pre-construction survey, a lot of these things are going to happen first. Um, while you're doing construction, you need to think about it. Like tell the operators to look for springs, look for water, look for difference in soil profile. Did you see a coal seam or something we didn't pick up? Reclamation, of course, um, that includes the seeding portion of things, if it is to be seeded. Um, picking the right seed mixes. Operations and restoration kind of go hand in hand. So you're going to have to do maintenance. You're going to have to do inspections. You're probably going to have to go back and do some more construction on some of them and kind of spot fix. But it's important to talk or think of these steps all the way through the process. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, successful restoration begins with effective pre-construction. That, that's the only way. There is no alternative. If we don't plan for ultimately restoring these sites, then there's there really is no other way back or no other path forward. But I, I absolutely agree with that. You start that one out. So when, when Sam mentioned best practices, best practices uh, kind of within, you know, how we view this is those existing best practices, you know, the, the little details that we see in every set of drawings, you know, how do we install the silicates, how do we install models, where are they located, uh, where these various things are applicable, uh, inspection frequencies, how do we maintain that. All of that falls within kind of the conventional industry standard best practices. The potential best practices is where Sam uh, comes in. So the way I like to think about it is the best practices that we have right now are silt fence, wattles, straw matting, the things that you see everywhere, hay bales, all of that good stuff. Um, but the way that we're thinking about it and trying to propose it to everybody is that there are potential best practices that someday may be our new best practices. So it's not that we're trying to hate on silt fence and waddles, they do their job, but they're temporary, right? They're supposed to be taken out, they're not permanent. So that's where the waddles are gonna turn into brush bundles. So bundles of sticks or straw or just vegetation biomass that you see and you make your own natural waddle and you put it there. So Tom DeSutter has always told me in reclamation, rough and loose. And what I look at when I'm out and doing a reclamation is what does it look like a hundred yards over there? Let's, let's make it look like that. So there's rocks everywhere. Like let's put rocks everywhere. Like that's what it was before we got here. So thinking about it that way, like soil nails would become live stakes, like using really long branches as anchors. Like we can think about how they did it 100, 400 years ago and kind of make it look like that. So this goes back uh, directly to one of the project reviews where we started looking at, at kind of an asset wide review of some of the issues we were facing in Ohio and West Virginia. And what ultimately caught the attention of the folks down south 
is that our slope stabilization and maintenance and slip repair costs, uh, in many cases, exceeded the cost to install the pipeline in the first place. And at that point, we had everybody's attention. So what we done uh, in Ohio is that we went through and looked at all of these, reached out to multiple engineers in that area that had uh, existing historical and, and uh, kind of a, a geographic background and understanding of the specific areas. But we went through and created our new typical best practice details. Details that were sufficiently detailed that we could then provide our operators, our construction teams, our construction groups, and vendors with that this is how we're gonna address or approach some of these various activities. This right here is one of those details. As we approach some of these areas, if we run into this condition, will one of these six different detailed alternatives be applicable there? We even went to the extent where um, we're discussing proctor, how to determine our proctor, how to actually, uh, the importance of moisture if we're using the line, <clears throat> and how we can actually calculate and ensure that we're getting proper and sufficient compaction. And that was, that more than anything was critical to ensuring that the work was being done completely. We had a great design. We had outstanding crews, but they simply weren't familiar with some of those critical details. Didn't cost any more to do it right. Didn't take any more time to do it right. It was just something they weren't aware of. And, and they were really accepting and embraced kind of, you know, this is what we're looking for. This is how we want to do it. So the way that we're kind of proposing our be potential best management practices are on a geotechnical level and a biological level. So first we have the geo solutions and we have gabion cages, which are just, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with them. They're kind of just like gated cages with rocks in them. Um, soil nails are just like concrete anchors. They can be concrete, they can be steel, they can be whatever you want to drive into the soil as an anchor. Geo webbing is listed up here. And I think this is similar to the talk last night of the con mods she may have mentioned. Um, but you would fill these in with soil and they would make like little, um, little pockets for things to grow and hold soil and geotech fabrics, which looks like on the very left side. Um, and we use synthetic fabric in some of our designs as well. What, one of the things I think is interesting, I don't know if everybody can hear me. One of the things that I think is really fascinating is this geotech solution is trying to, uh, from a, from a engineering standpoint, duplicate what that biological solution or history would be. And, and I think that's really what, what we would hope we start working towards is that that basically is a synthetic root system, uh, a synthetic drainage system to try and mitigate that. Whereas, you know, an effective plant community, getting things developed uh, and in place does exactly what you're saying with these biotech solutions. So now we have the biotech case example. So what we did is we, figured that, like what Harold just said, the geotech fabric, like let's get away from that and try to do a phyto or biological approach to one of these projects. So our goal, right, is to get a really good root system as the anchors into the soil to stabilize it. And at the same time, we had some water drainage issues. So to, in a healthy way, get rid of that water, it was just going to be uptick by the plants. So what we did is we did a very intensive um, vegetation survey on a bunch of right -aways. And we found a bunch of shrubs, um, forbs and grasses, and just compiled everything that we had. And then we went to a bunch of nurseries that were local and it took a couple days to get the source that we needed, but we found um, buttonbush, elderberry, we had some snowberry, no, not snowberry, um, snow gray, dogwood, and a suite of other shrubs that we wanted to plant. Um, so we sourced hundreds, probably thousands of these bushes that are four foot seedlings. And we 
hucked out there and we started planting them in the slips. Like wherever you found a crack that it was sliding off right there, the scarp, we would, you know, just shove a bunch of plants in there. Um, and I, <laughs> so a little anecdote for everyone. Um, apparently if you're carrying four foot seedlings of very inconspicuous plants through the backwoods of West Virginia, it's maybe frowned upon or a little questionable. So Harold got a call from his superior who got a call from his superior who was notified. Yeah, who notified him that the SWAT team was on their way to check out a group of people who were planting illegal marijuana plants in the middle of the woods in West Virginia. So not 15 seconds later, my phone rings and Harold said, don't be alarmed. The SWAT team is on their way. And I said, oh, okay, all right, why? And he tells me and not 10 seconds later, I look up and there's a helicopter just flying over us. So if you ever think you're not being watched, you're being watched. Um, but yeah, after that, we, we planted all the bushes that we sourced from someone else. And we're like, hey, why can't we do this ourselves? So we went ahead and we built a greenhouse. And what we did was we took a bunch of transects. We went out and we clipped clippings off of trees and shrubs and forbs. And we brought them back to the greenhouse. And we wanted to see at the scale that we had and the skills and resources that we had, what transplants would survive. If we had everything we needed, we could get them all to survive. But which ones right now would make it? So we narrowed it down to some species that would work. And we decided, like, these are the ones that we could transplant. Um, I wanted to make a connection back to the talk last night for those that were here. I think there was a dwarf burning bush was maybe the species that was recommended by one of the nurseries, but we decided to go against it because it was an invasive species. But we kind of looking back after the talk last night and we talked about it too, it was like, if we're trying to get a very good root system and we want as many plants as we can out there, don't we want something somewhat invasive? So we're like, what's worse? Like having an invasive species that's already present there, but, or having a slip that could lead to something catastrophic. Like in Ohio, it can be very catastrophic. North Dakota, maybe not as bad, but that's just something to think about. Like maybe, you know, weeds aren't that bad was the thing last night. So I'm not saying go plant invasive species, but just think about it. Like what's, what's worse? And is this something that we could manage the species? for a while. Um, so in this example, we, you know, we haven't um, completed or gotten rid of all the slips out there with this product. But another really good point that we made that leads back to like the landowners is that they were all very happy with the species that we picked because they were food plots for all the deer and all the turkey that they hunt out there. So that was something that we're like, you know, this is you know, like two birds, three birds, four birds, four birds with one stone. Like we can knock off a lot of those risks with this method. Yeah, and that was exactly it. So the landowner, um, you know, our land department went through the uh, kind of identification of what plants we're going to plant. That came early, early on in, in the project. And the landowner has already kind of timed for, you know, what's going to be going on. And having this conversation, trying to characterize what we would like to try was a critical component of that. And, and characterizing it in such a way, hey, do you hunt on this land? Uh, we're going to have food for wildlife. Your right away are going to be covered in turkeys and all that. And that, that's a legitimate, you know, uh, statement. Uh, this, this right here was a conversation uh, that we built a greenhouse in front of the corporate offices for a natural gas midstream company that raised the eyebrows. <laughs> so, but it, 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 the purpose of it was, was kind of understood, you know, within time, uh, the guys kind of understood, you know, why we're doing it, how we were trying to do it. It's going to save money. Uh, we're not going to have them guys have to climb down with incredibly steep slopes. But another kind of anecdotal story about that as well, uh, we had an opportunity to speak to the landowner where the office and one of the compressor stations was located. Uh, historically, before he sold it, 
uh, it was a grape winer, and he was ecstatic that after we planted or built the greenhouse and, and explained to him what we're trying to do, um, they're having lunches and potlucks and sharing information that really, really wasn't interesting and, and positive. On this one here, uh, what we're looking at is the top, just like I, I spoke earlier about, uh, you know, developing a proctor, trying to explain how that proctor is a critical component when we're looking at compaction in various soils, but also the methods and how we can develop uh, methods that can be deployed or utilized that are that are very, very effective and easily to can be easily uh, completed by by our, our vendors and contractor base that we all already have. So, you know, as far as how do we incorporate the lime into the soils, all of that, you know, it, it really went seamless. And that was our focus. We we provided uh, some of these potential or alternative best practices uh, as a function. So when we look at the function, this is what we need to do and then reach out to them. How do we do that? You know, what equipment would be best to do that? How do we approach that? How do we, can we kind of realize what we're trying to do there? And actually made our contractors part of the solution. And it was extraordinarily helpful. Yep, then the other two photos here, we just have on the right, all the um, tree branches that were harvested during the, the reclamation phase. Um, and I feel like on most pipeline right of here, that would kind of just be something you would shrug off and be like, oh, well, we could burn it or, you know, maybe we'll just leave it in a pile. But here we actually made those brush bundles and you can make those brush bundles out of those or live stakes or something. So we did that. And then the bottom photo is just a little look into my life of installing shrubs for months. Um, but that's the slopes that you're dealing with and you can kind of see where it's sloughing off there. So that's the target of like the top of the scarf where we wanted to introduce those roots. Yeah, the thought on this one is that the, the slip had had stabilized itself. So one of the questions we had is, can we go into some of these areas that have, have historically had issues and prevent or mitigate things working? So this was in an ideal location. There wasn't a potential threat to uh, surface water or anything like that. We were able to be really effective here. Uh, going back to uh, as Sam mentioned on the brush bundles, uh, from an operator or construction standpoint, I'm already spending that money. You know, when we purchase bottles, when we purchase silk fence, when we go through the, the installation of them, all of that cost is already built into the project. We aren't doing something extra. We aren't doing something more. We aren't adding cost. We're just trying to approach that problem with the resources and budgets we already have to do it a slightly different way. Oh, you can take this one. <laughs> I'm not digging the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Here we're looking at post-construction. So uh, one of the issues that we've had, and I'll pitch this right off the bat, just because it, it hurts me every time I look at that, is uh, that thing right there. That is a temporary control structure. Everybody's familiar with the cell fence. What I have a problem with is that our right-of-ways have already achieved 70% vegetation. So temporary structures, and it's just a peeve, they're temporary. So one of the other primary uh, risk triggers for some of our failures was that these temporary structures become semi permanent and they're never removed. Uh, not only are they never removed, oftentimes they're forgotten and they're not maintained. What will happen is debris, uh, leaf litter, and debris piles up against our silk fences. Uh, it'll create a plug, and all of a sudden, this silk fence becomes a new trench breaker. And then what that does is that actually starts pulling up water pretty soon. I have a little hole that pops up and I'll have a little soft spot down, down gradient of my silk fence. That did not need to be there to begin with. Then what happens, the rest of the slope 
is up there and it sheets the next time it rains. And somehow it finds that little hole from that pile of leaves that got plugged up against the silt fence that didn't need to be there. And then I have a slope there. So some of these things from a uh, maintenance and, and operation standpoint, when those control temporary control features are no longer needed, uh, they, they do need to be removed. So, and, and they may be changed, they may be uh, relocated, uh, or they may be no longer necessary. And it's critical that we're out there inspecting and when they're no longer needed, we pull them out. And I think just to touch on the bio side of things, those, those can be more permanent, right? Because they're natural, they look natural, they're part of the landscape, and those are things that we can leave in place. So those are positive alternatives to those. Yeah, that's like with the brush bundles uh, in, in, as an alternative to wattles is those brush bundles will naturally decay and break down. So two to three years down the road, uh, a lot of those control features, the, the potential negative as far as how water is going to hit them or or inhibiting water flow, uh, they've already begun to decay. So it, it's the ideal solution from uh, kind of that interim erosion control question. So with revegetation, this starts during that reclamation phase. So I think Plant communities, plant diversity, we hear that all the time. That's a huge thing. 70%. Um, so we always hear 70% vegetation, and then that's when that's when we're good. Um, so how do we get there is, is the problem. And that's where everything that we've shown today is just, you know, it's not a formula or an equation or a one-size-fits-all. It's just a few more things to get everyone to think about. And that um, I think last night's talk was really good about that too. Like everything's not going to work, but at least you're making efforts and then you can go back and adjust the next time. Um, so methods up there, drilling, broadcasting, hydro mulch, sod and transplant. So broadcasting is really what's going to be happening the most on these steep slopes. You're not going to be able to get equipment like you could on a flat slope in some of these areas. Um, so broadcasting and a combination of hydro mulch, we've done that on a lot of them and had really good success. Um, sod and transplant, um, transplants is what we considered with those seedlings. We also did plugs like small, um, those grass plugs and had good success with that as well. Yeah, we did, we looked through all of those. So if it was uh, a potential soil nailing candidate, we looked at green states. Um, when we look at it, you know, potentially changing up the the seed varieties that are going to be in specific areas, and we went down to sunny to shade, you know, and, and from a discussion standpoint, you know, is there a better suited uh, plant species for one side of these droughts than the other? And in those areas where there potentially could be changes, several changes within that that kind of ideal or optimal optimal species, that kind of hydromulking was, was kind of the, the ideal situation. Another thing, and uh, it would apply to North Dakota, I believe, as well, uh, when we look at it from kind of a, a historical or what that pre-existing plant community was, and kind of the, the microbiotic uh, community that would have been uh, present in a woody plant community versus what we're trying to grow in a in a grass community, and that hydromorphine allowed us to to kind of try and mitigate or or proactively go through that as well. This is starting to get uh, more just towards a summary. Um, one of the things that that we realized. Uh, right at the get-go that, that right-of-way inspections are a critical aspect of uh, um, cost-effective, a environmentally reliable uh, right-of-way maintenance program. So when in this location, what we've done is, is located uh, a camera and actually flew all these right-of-ways with a low-level overflight with a high definition camera. 
with one of our right of way inspectors. So as we flew through some of these areas, you can see here, this is kind of our general right of way. You can see the path coming that they're accessing some of these areas, some of our temporary control measures. In this case, you can see bare dirt, so it's applicable or appropriate. And then some of the erosion control matter. Not a big fan of that. Don't like it. But uh, this was the exact uh, or an ideal way to inspect these rivals. So that was one of the things that we changed that annually we would go through with and just take that low level slope light through these areas and just see if, if anything condition wise potentially had changed or migrated. Uh, the establishing of, of authority. What we're looking at is kind of empowering our operations through to be able to raise concerns or questions. If something is impossible to do, something is wrong. If something is extraordinarily difficult to do, we need to we need to improve it and see how we can actually, you know, kind of do what we need to do, but we have to be able to do it in a a reliable, effective, and safe manner. You can take that one away. So this this kind of leads into the comment there, uh, kind of creating that culture of environmental stewardship. Uh, huge and extraordinarily helpful in in developing that relationship with our landowners. It's it's uh, well, it's just priceless. You just you just can't. Uh, emphasize not how much value of that has. The same thing with our community and landowners, uh, engaging them, whether that be simply asking questions, is there any concerns, anything that they would do different, if there's anything that potentially they would have noticed. Uh, this last one, collaborating with academics, NGOs, regulatory agencies, and other industry partners. Um, there is an extraordinary amount of expertise, knowledge, and skills available that, that I believe are virtually untapped. I think asking that question uh, in various forums, um, see how much trouble I have in speaking. So as awkward as my questions may have been, has been uh, extraordinarily helpful, kind of developing some of these potential methods moving forward. Yeah, I think just to touch on that, um, we we did learn a lot from our landowners when we were out there. I think that was after the first couple of projects, we were like, hey, first step, let's just go talk to the landowner. And we walked out there with them. They showed us where the slips were because they're out there every single day. And they were like, hey, this one happened then and this one always happens or this one's new, like why? Um, like there's bedrock outcrops here and there's an old bridge that this carriage used to cross path like 300 years ago. Things that we never would have maybe seen with our eye because we're thinking about different things. So use your resources and in any sort of construction practices, don't be afraid to reach out to landowners and talk to them, get to know them and get to know their land because they know it best. So. Yeah, they're going to make comments that uh, my tractor gets stuck there every May. You know, mm -hmm. those are those are the kind of critical information and comments. And they're they're gonna freely share that every every time you speak with them, you know, they're gonna drop those pearls of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And we just have some links. I think this will be posted. So some resources for everyone and Harold and I are happy to be your resources as well. So that improving steep, uh, steep slope pipeline construction, that was a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy and several different pipeline companies as they were looking at kind of the existing best, pra pra best practices and what potentially could be potential best practices. I found it extraordinarily helpful in, in kind of engaging that kind of function conversation with a lot of our, our contractors and operators. Uh, another thing, uh, when I was young, back in the 80s, I worked on steep slopes, but it was in a completely different industry. That was uh, for a small company in Twisp, Washington called Lloyd Block. And in, in some cases, we drove closures up and down, ridiculously steep slopes. In other cases, we walked up and down. Uh, a lot of the information that we have here 
and some of the technical resources, uh, there's a century of extraordinarily helpful and applicable information related to the logging industry that is directly ties to uh, how, how steep slopes are managed. Uh, some of the Forest Service information is absolutely the best. And, and I think sometimes, uh, sometimes we may operate in a little bit of a bubble and, and we don't uh, try to find those similarities in, in other industries. Questions? Questions. Yeah, question. Well, we're not going to worry about invasives anymore. Have you thought about saying something that actually works, like kudzu or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, blackberries, yeah, blackberries. I don't think we could never need a silk fence again, but it's <laughs> yeah, nothing bigger than cottontails when they get in there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Take that up with your local okay. forest service rep. <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you to you too. I'd love to have this anecdote and stuff like this. Like, you know, I think that's one big thing for this conference. That's just sort of maybe kind of the last talk that we had on this. Um, oh, sorry, another question. It's just more of a comment. How would the advanced technology and UAS and all that stuff uh, being able to utilize our technology to identify all the historic slope areas? Maybe you might find something to be working on. Uh, yeah, just my thought. No, it's a good comment. We've talked about that too. And like with the pre-construction, this needs to start then. And with the routing, like exactly get that data first and then make your route and then do an inspection. So you're, you know, double tapping it. Yeah, absolutely. On pre-existing or, or current right-of-ways that are in place, right now we have that, that information is publicly available. Uh, from uh, USGS's recent Landsat 9 to some of the other, LIDAR related, that, that literally is what you're thinking. I can't access it, I don't understand that. <laughs> I know what's there and I think it's different. But yeah, that's absolutely right. That information is there. Having or utilizing that or trying to incorporate it, absolutely, extraordinarily. That's just one of those things that we, we simply take for granted and, and isn't utilized, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Any other questions? 